this morning. I did. Yes, so did I. Yeah. Something about it. It's just it's one of the cleverest things that somebody ever wrote. It's really funny. Oh, that's right. Mark, do you have that paper? I'll read it if you do. I no, I got my Bible. Well, I might go get it. I'll just take your second. You, you can go ahead. All right. We've got nothing better to do but to enjoy each other's fellowship. That's and right. That's <laughs> oh yes, I forgot. We're talking about things that Martha wasn't even a part of this morning. Oh, well, don't tell her we're talking about her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, uh, the little Bible study that I used to uh, minister to, um, uh, one of the people there, his name was Ricky, and he, he had this Christian magazine, and he found it in there, and he showed it to me once, and he read it to everybody, I just thought it was so funny, so hopefully uh, Martha will think it's just as funny as we all did. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've looked for it before, too, on the internet, you know, I consider myself a pretty good Googler, you know, getting on there and finding stuff, and I've looked before, and I couldn't find it, and today it just popped right up. That's right. That's right. Keep on seeking. There you go. All right. A bit of levity for our evening. All right. Well, the story goes there was a church where a preacher and the uh, minister of music were not getting along. As time went by, this began to spill over into the worship service. The first week, the preacher preached on commitment and how we all should dedicate ourselves to the service of God. So the music director led the song, I Shall Not Be Moved. <laughs> the second week, the preacher preached on tithing, and how we all should gladly give to the work of the Lord. So the director led the song, Jesus paid it all. The third week, the preacher preached on gossiping, and how we should all watch our tongues. And so the music leader led the song, I love to tell the story. <laughs> I don't know, that one really, that's, that's the one that gets me the most. <laughs> uh, with all this going on, the preacher became very disgusted over the situation. The following Sunday, told the congregation that he was considering resigning. So, of course, the musician led the song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? <laughs> The next week, he informed the church that it was Jesus who led him there, and it was Jesus who was taking him away. And so the music leader led the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> that is a good one. I owe that to my friend, Ricky Lambert. All right. Well, the book of Haggai is where we are. <clears throat> well, Marie always likes it when the pastor opens up with a joke. She loves Joel Osteen. And every time, you know, he's about to preach, the first thing he does is give you a little, little laugh, and then he gets into the Word. All right, Haggai chapter 2. We're just going to look at one verse this evening. Verse 5 of chapter 2. According to the Word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. What a verse. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. I love this verse. There's so much in this verse. And so I wanted to just spend some time on this one singular verse, taking it apart and hoping to apply it to our lives in such a way that we might leave this place encouraged. Because the Lord has not simply told us and asked us not to fear, but He has given us His Spirit and His presence all of our life long that we might not have cause to fear. Fear is something that can be debilitating to anyone's life. And it is something that, to the Christian, can really stop us cold in our tracks. I have seen too many engaged in the work of the Lord and on fire for Jesus, and yet something made them afraid, Something caused them to be embittered, and the fear began to take hold of their life. Their faith began to wither, and suddenly, well actually not suddenly, but over a course of time and events, they just can't see God as one who is the provider. They no longer can see God as their heavenly Father, the one that they can trust, the one that, the, the one that they can go to when they are afraid. They believe God has failed them, and their faith has withered within them. 
And so they walk away. They may keep a head knowledge of religion and sort of consider themselves a Christian in general, but they begin to lack all those things in life that, that mark us as believers. They begin to slink away from the fellowship of the believers. They begin to tire of spending time in the prayer closet. They begin to simply engage in a life of self, far away from the place of the Spirit. And the Lord understands our frame. And so time and again, He encourages us in His Word throughout the entirety of Scripture. So often do we read, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Do not be discouraged. Do not worry. Do not be afraid. It is because the Lord knows our frame. It is because our Savior understands us and sympathizes with us. He knows that things do cause us to fear. He understands the human condition because Jesus indeed became a man. He took on this, this frail flesh. He, he lived a life just as we live, so he might experience the things that we experience. And so even in the life of the Christ, we see him in the garden. And we see him fearing the cross, fearing that separation from his Father. And yet we see him encouraged by the Father. As an angel was sent there to Jesus in the garden to minister to him, to encourage him, to lift him up that he might be able to bear the cross that lie before him, that cross that he so despised, yet he endured for our sake. Jesus took on flesh. He took on the human condition that he might be a high priest who indeed can sympathize with us, who can relate to us, who understands why we're afraid when we're afraid, who understands what makes us to feel fear and anxiety. He understands all of those things, and yet we are called to walk in His footsteps, that even through fear, we might be victorious, that through fear, we might overcome the fear, because we know the Father loves us. Well, before we get too much into our study with all of that, let's look at what the Lord told His people all these millennia ago, through the prophet Haggai where he says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. God, I want you to hearken back, he tells Haggai. He tells the people of Judah in Haggai's day. I want you to remember. I want you to think back. Think back in your history when I brought your people out of Egypt by the hand of Moses. According to the word that I covenanted with you, way back then. And you can go through the book of Exodus, and there's that passage that you come to, I believe it's in chapter 24, where there's a sacrifice made, and an offering is a, is, ascends up in smoke, and the Lord covenants with His people to be their God, for them to be His people. And the people say, you will be our God. We, we believe you. We hear you. We, we understand your word. We desire your covenant. And so we agree on this covenant. There's a few different places there in the book of Exodus. You can do your homework later on and seek those things out. Where the Lord says, okay, I brought you out to myself. I want you to be my people. I promise to be your God. Let us make a covenant together. Now the Hebrew word for covenant is the word to cut. So often you may have heard a pastor or read in the scriptures where the people talk about, let us cut covenant. It's because in the Hebrew idea of a promise made or a covenant agreed upon, there was always the shedding of blood. There was always the animal sacrifice. And the animal's body would be cut, would be separated, would be offered between the two parties. Here in this case, the animal was offered to make a covenant between the people of Israel under the leadership of Moses and Yehovah, their God. There was a covenant that was made. There was bloodshed. There was the sacrifice that was cut asunder. There was the promise made and the covenant agreed to. You be my people, I shall be your God. You trust in me and I shall provide for your needs. And so the Lord calls them through Haggai. 
according to the word that I covenanted with you, with this nation, with your people, when you came out of Egypt, according to that covenant of bloodshed, according to those great miracles and plagues by which I delivered you out from under the hand of Pharaoh by the hand of Moses, through those ten plagues culminating in the death of every firstborn in Egypt, such a wailing and a weeping and a cry was heard in Egypt that day that never such a cry was ever to be heard again. Such was the destruction that God brought upon that great nation, bringing them to their knees as He brought His people out. According to the covenant that I made with you back then, when I brought you out of Egypt, when you came out of Egypt, under that covenant, according to that covenant, so my spirit remains among you. I promised you back then that I would always be with you. I promised you back then, I promised your fathers as they wandered the wilderness. And that was out of disobedience, by the way. Remember, God called them straight into the promised land. He had them hang around at Sinai for about a year. But they were basically to end up in Sinai about a year and a half after they left Egypt. That was the plan. According to their disobedience, they wandered in the wilderness because they were afraid to enter into the land that God had promised them. And yet even in their disobedience, God promised to take care of them. And so we read that their feet did not swell, their clothes did not wear out. God provided them manna and water in the desert and in the wilderness. God provided for every single need because He had promised to do so. And even in their disobedience, His hand was upon them to lead them to guide them. And he was always there for them. Armies marched against them. And yet when they were obedient to God, no army could stand against them. But they enjoyed victory after victory after victory because the Lord their God went before them because he had promised to do so. So he says, according to the word that I covenanted with you way back then, with your fathers and grandfathers, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit to this day remains among you. You see, I'm the same God today, yesterday, today and forever. I am the same God who brought your fathers out of Egypt. And the spirit that was with them then, that spirit, my spirit, is with you even now. Remember, they came out of Egypt and they had nothing. And yet God provided for them. They had been in bondage and servitude for hundreds of years. And so these slaves came out into the wilderness and God took care of them and led them in eventually to that promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And in the promised land where there were giants, the giants fell. In the promised land where there were high walled cities, the walls fell. In the promised land where there were armies that marched against them, those armies fell and fled before them because God was on their side and God said, I keep my promises. I promised you this land and I have given you this land and no enemy has been able to stand against you and he promised that he would give them rest and we read in Joshua 21 that indeed they rested from war in that land and enjoyed great peace and prosperity there in God's promised land. And so the spirit that was with your people way back then is the spirit that's with you today. You have just come out of Babylon. Remember, we've set the context in previous studies. Haggai's people were the small remnant that had come back from Babylon to Judah and Jerusalem. It wasn't many. Most people didn't want to come back. But the few, the remnant, had returned. And they were discouraged. They were dismayed. They came back to rubble, to ruin, to desolation and destruction. They came to a mess, to a pile of, of just rubble. There was nothing good about where they returned to. There was just a big mess to clean up. There was, they had to start all over. And God says, look, just as I brought your fathers out of Egypt, I brought you out of Babylon. Just as I brought them into this land, I brought you back into this land. And just as my spirit was with them, so my spirit this day is with you. I promise to be with you back then. And I am keeping that promise yet today in your life 
and in your country. And so he says, because of this, because of this covenant, because of my spirit, I now ask you not to fear. I now exhort you, do not fear. I request that you would cast those fears and those cares upon me, that you might see me strong and powerful in your life. Now, this passage, there's the historical context for it. That's what it meant to Haggai and to his people. But what does this verse mean to us? What should it mean to us? This verse is such a wonderful verse. We must apply it to our lives. We must take it from the pages of history and place it deep within our hearts. For the Lord would say the same thing to you and me. Amen. According to the covenant, the blood covenant that was made between you and me when I brought you out of the world. Now what covenant is that? That's the new covenant that Jesus spoke of. A covenant in and by His blood. This is my blood that is shared for you, he told his disciples as he held up that cup of wine. Because I'm establishing a new covenant. I am going to be taken into the hands of sinners. I'm going to be crucified on the cross. And by my blood, as this wine represents, I will establish a new covenant with you. A new covenant. Made by the blood that was shed on the cross. The Son of Man would be bruised and broken. He would be bloodied and killed upon the tree for you and for me. And the Lord desires to speak to your heart in your times of anxiety and fear and worry. And He wants you to go back. He says, come back with me in your mind's eye. And according to the word that I covenanted with you when I brought you out of the world, when I redeemed you unto myself, when I paid the ransom for your very soul, I want you to remember where our relationship started. Let's go back to the beginning. And what I'm about to tell you is based on that, on the blood of my son, on the blood that was shed on the cross, according to the word that I covenanted with you when I brought you out of the world. Do you remember the word? Do you remember the promise? Believe on me, and you will never die. Amen. Believe on me, for he who lives and believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. Though our bodies give out, we know the loved ones that are no longer among us, whom we have mourned for, whom have gone before us to heaven. We know that the body wears out, but we believe that life goes on because we are not merely mortal beings. We are not merely beings of flesh and bone, but we are made in the image of God, and we are spirit. There is a spirit. Well, it's dead if you have not met Christ. Your spirit is dead. It has not been made alive. And yet for us, who have come to the cross of Christ, for us, who have received Christ into our life, the Bible tells us that our spirit has been made alive in Him, so that when this body dies... There's more to life than that. There is life yet in death. And our spirit lives on because it has been made alive because of the blood that was shed. Jesus paid the price for the sins that were weighing us down to hell. He paid the price that our spirit might be made alive in Him, that we might be with Him forever, long after these bodies are no good to us. You see, the Lord promised eternal life. If you come to me, if you believe in me, I will take away death. I will conquer death in your life. And one day we're going to experience that. You know, we all approach death's door. Some sooner or later than others. I, I read about that little baby girl that was abducted from a Walmart. And, and killed at such a young age of eight years old. You know, some of us get to live a longer life and yet others are cut so short. We each have this different life experience. And yet, for the Christian, this flesh, this mortal body is nothing but a tent, as the scripture might tell us. It's just this temporary housing that is available to us so we might accomplish something here on the earth while we're here. And yet our spirit, when it's freed from this body, lives on forever in the place of heaven where God dwells. So he promised us life. 
And he also promised to be with us in this life. So, okay, believe in me, and I'm going to give you eternal life. But trust in me, and I'm going to take you through this life. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. And Jesus taught us to pray, to have communion with the Father. Jesus taught us to trust in the Father's will above even our own. Jesus said in the garden, okay, take this cup away from me. Yet, if that's not your will, let your will be done. Here's my will, Father, take the cup away. I despise this cross. I don't want to go to the cross. If there's any other way, Father, take this cup away. But your will be done. We need to learn that prayer. To trust. To trust. You see, if we learn to trust, that is when fear begins to disappear. When we truly learn to trust. You see, if I believe that the Lord knows best. And if I believe that He has a plan for my life, and if I believe that He will use my life if I am surrendered to Him, if I truly yield myself to Him as Jesus yielded His life to the Father, surrendering everything, emptying Himself of everything, if I do that, then suddenly I'm not so worried when I don't have enough money to pay the bill. I'm not so concerned when my health begins to fail. Because the Lord is at work in my life. And whether good things come to me or bad things happen to me, He desires through me to be glorified. And if I am seeking how I might glorify the Lord through every circumstance that comes, then I will know what it means to trust, and I will begin to forget what it means to fear. So often we're afraid because of the pride we have of, of our own life. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to accomplish this. I want to be able to go here. I want to be able to have a relationship with this person. Or I want to be able to accomplish this task or whatever it might be. We have our own will that's in the way. And when our own will is obstructed, we begin to be afraid because I want that to happen. I want this to succeed. I, I have this in me that desires my own success for my own glory. And I begin to be weighed down, I begin to be bothered when things that would glorify me don't begin to work out. But whether I can't find a job, or whether my health begins to fail, or whether there's something going on in my family, or something going on in this church, or something going on in the country, I say, Lord, how can I glorify you in this? And we're free to... Tell the Lord what we would like to see, as Jesus did. Jesus said, take this cup away from me, but your will be done. So we're free to say to the Father, Lord, here's what I'd like to see. But your will above all is what I want in my life. If we would begin to humble ourselves before the Father, we would begin to see Him lift us up. We would begin to realize that our fears begin to fade. How else did the martyrs go to the guillotine, or to the axe, or to the sword, or to the stake, or to the beasts, or to prison? How else did the martyrs go through what they went through to have such a great and glorious testimony for God? How else did the martyrs give their lives except for they counted their lives as nothing? They offered their lives to the Father. I am a living sacrifice, and they meant it. And so the fear faded, and they went to the lions. Now you might say, but, you know, some things scare me. It, it, the Lord doesn't want me to be scared ever? No, that's not at all what we're talking about. You see, the Lord has created us as emotional beings. And it is not a sin to have an emotional response or a psychological reaction to an event or a circumstance that comes upon you or that happens to you. But what do you do with it? See, it's one thing to be scared for the moment, but it's another to live in fear. There's a whole different thing. And the Bible tells us the answer to fear is the love of God. Because love casts out fear. If I know that God loves me, then I have no reason to fear. I have no reason to fear. I may be scared, but I'm not afraid. There is a difference. We have an emotional response, a psychological reaction, but then I give it to the Lord. Say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. 
I am your living sacrifice. You purchased me for a price. I am yours and I am not my own. If the church and if Christians, if we could just learn to have an ounce of humility in our lives, we might begin to live and to walk, not just as Jesus did, but as his disciples did, and as his martyrs have done. We might begin to learn what it means to truly be the Lord's. I am my beloved, and he is mine. The Lord, my God, I belong to him because of that covenant that he made with me long ago. He purchased me by the blood of his own son. And he takes me back there. And he reminds me of this fact. And he says, look, the spirit that was with you then, when you knelt at the cross of my son, the spirit that indwelt you at that moment, fills you even now. That's why the Bible tells us, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to receive Christ and to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but as the world gets in the way, and as our faith begins to turn into fear, we, we begin to forget about the things of God. We begin to forget what He saved us from in the beginning. We begin to forget about His Spirit that was given to us. So the Bible encourages us to be filled again. Come back to the cross. Allow the Holy Spirit to fall on you once more to remind you of that covenant, of that blood, of that love, of the cross of Christ, which made peace between you and God, which made peace. Jesus made peace for us and the Father by the blood of his cross. Go back to that. Remember that the spirit that fell upon you then, that brought you to the cross, is the same spirit that is with you now. Even so, my spirit remains among you. To be with you always. To encourage you. To empower you. The Lord has empowered us with his spirit. We, we need to receive all that God has for us by his spirit. We need to get closer to him through his word. We need to get more familiar with him through a prayer life that we should cultivate and allow to grow. And really get to know what it means to walk in the Spirit. To walk every day with the Spirit at our side. To walk every day in the footsteps of the Christ. And the Lord is really telling us if we would go back to the cross and remember His covenant, His blood, His love, that the Spirit that was upon us then is with us now, then we would understand we have no reason to fear. We may be scared, but we are not afraid. We have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear. God tells us not to fear because He is with us. He's always been there and He's here even now. And so He says simply and plainly, do not fear. You wonder what the will of God is for your life? So often we lift our hands and say, Lord, what is your will for my life? Right here. Do not fear. Get close to me. Remember my covenant. Walk cleansed in my blood. Walk filled with my spirit. Walk as one who is overcoming and victorious. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? And as Hannah Smith so wisely once said, as she commented on that verse, if God is for us, it doesn't matter who comes against us. It really doesn't. Because we can face whatever the world and the enemy throws at us in the name of God. Jesus. So he says, do not fear. Do not fear. And what did Jesus say? And lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. As long as the church goes on, until that day of rapture, Jesus is with his people, with his church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Sometimes the gates of hell prevail against us, because we have gotten away from him. We get away from fellowship with the Father, with fellowship with the Spirit. We get away from fellowship with believers in the church. We get away from God and His house. And we wonder why the gates of hell begin to prevail against our lives. But when we are walking close to Him, God will use our life for His glory no matter what takes place. You read through the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And we're amazed by the wonderful stories that are recounted of people who by faith accomplished great and amazing feats for the Lord, empowered by His Holy Spirit. 
We read about those who stop the lion's mouths, who quench the fire. We read about those like Samson and Gideon who conquered armies. But don't forget other things that were accomplished by faith. You get to the end of that chapter, and he speaks of those who were tortured and tormented, sawn asunder. He speaks of those who lived lives of poverty. He speaks of those who wandered the wilderness destitute. And they did so by faith. The same faith that quenched, that quenched the lion's mouths and quenched the fire's flames is the same faith that other Christians have had to go through the lion's mouths and through the fire's flames. By faith. What has God called you to do? You can accomplish that by faith. That's why Paul could say, I've learned how to be content in whatever state I am in. Whether I'm hungry or I'm full, whether I'm rich or I'm poor, I can be content because I know I serve the Lord. And if I serve Him, that is reason to be content because He bought me, He paid for me. And so Paul would tell us in his letters, he says, don't think you have to move around in your life. Be content where you have been called. Where were you when God called you? Don't try to get away from that position. Don't try to get away from that place. So many Christians find themselves moving around, moving from here to there, and sometimes church hopping from here to there, and moving all around looking for the will of God. Is the will of God here? Is the will of God over there? Is He here? Is He there? Where is He? Jesus talked about the foolish people who, who look all over the place for the Messiah. Is He over here? Is He in this closet? Is He up there in that room? Where is He? Christians are to be content where God has called them. That's where His will is. His will is where you are. Now, if you find your, play, uh, your, your uh, life in the place of Jonah, where you're actively running away from God's will, well, that's a whole different story. But if you have surrendered your life to God, then you are where He has called you. You are who He has called you to be. You are His and that's what he has asked of you. And so he says, remember that covenant. The covenant of blood which my son made for you on the cross. By which he has made peace between you and me. Remember that my spirit that was with you then is with you now. Empowering you and there to lift you up. And I call your name. And I ask you not to fear. For my name's sake. Because I'm here. And I'm with you. This is the word of the Lord. Haggai's audience could have received it or rejected it. What will we do with it? Okay, Lord, I'm yours or I'm just another, just another Bible verse that I don't understand or can't seem to appropriate. There's a decision for us. Will we believe the word of the Lord and walk in victory or, we will, or will we succumb to fear and walk in defeat? The choice is ours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the covenant which you have made, for the spirit which you have given, and for the promises that you have assured. Lord, you've asked us not to fear. You have told us not to fear, not to worry. And Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to be so close to you that we begin to understand how these verses can work in our life. Help us, Lord, to understand your love. And might your love, Lord, begin to eradicate the fears of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Amen. We'll see you on Wednesday.